Hello, and it looks like we are live. So Facebook tells me, could you guys just confirm that you can hear me okay? Just want to do a quick sound check before, uh, before we move on. And if you're watching this on replay, then just fast forward <laughs> until I get good, uh, get a bit of an audience, and then we can. And then we can start. For those of you who can hear me or who are joining us live, could you confirm that? Yes. Okay. We, you can hear me. That's awesome. Thank you. I think that's Lisa today, my assistant who is with us. Um, okay. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, this is yet another call on live Q and A's with Magdalena on Fridays. I do this every Friday unless I'm traveling or something is going on. So tell me where are you from? and um, where are you tuning in from and today I really want to kind of zoom into the different symptoms of hormonal imbalances and I'm curious what is it that you're suffering from so if you can share that with me that would be really awesome um, and uh, it's Angela today hi Angela that's one of my uh, team members awesome so yeah, so let me know what is it, what is the biggest hormonal imbalance that you are struggling with, if you do know. Uh, hello from Illinois, Robin Keith. Uh, she's one of our regulars. Welcome. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I'm always, I'm always interested to know what is it that you're struggling with because that's really important for me to, to, um, to zoom like, the conversation in that direction, right? And, um, and so that's Tammy from Daphne AI. Uh, hello from New York, Jem, Jem Alba. Hi, Edith. Uh, and I'm curious, are you guys new here or have you, have you logged in before to the live calls? Uh, hello from the south of Florida here, Karen Lomarno, Lom Lomardo. Um, great. So, you know, it's interesting with these, um, with these kind of um, issues when it comes to hormonal imbalances, right? Because sometimes we realize what is it that is coming from a hormonal imbalance, but sometimes a lot of times there's a lot of symptoms we're dealing with that we are not even, that we, we are not connecting it as being correlated directly or indirectly with the hormones. And so, so Ed is from Ottawa. Uh, we've got uh, from New Jersey, uh, Mahmouda. And um, Darlina, Darla from Ohio, menopause. So we got brain, menopause, brain fog, low mood, low energy, weight gain, 17 days long periods. Ooh, okay. Um, hot flashes. Um, Nora Shumate also is from Colorado. Where are you from in Colorado, Nora? I'm in Boulder. Uh, Jacksonville, Florida. She's new here. Welcome, Charlotte. Um, and let's see. So Jennifer says brain fog. Okay, so I just read that out. Um, Hello from Ottawa, great. Uh, Carol from California, uh, North California, I have a pituitary tumor, okay. Yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> it's kind of, I find it um, kind of interesting that most of the time, by the way, can you hear the bird? <laughs> There's this bird that just gets so loud sometimes. It's really cute though. Um, so, you know, one of the, uh, so a lot of times hormonal imbalances would be, uh, you know, clear symptoms like, for example, a period that's 17 days or a period that doesn't come. Menopause, obviously, related to hormones, right? Hormonal imbalances or low estrogen, for that matter, with menopause or perimenopause, we're entering that stage, low progesterone as well, so everything is dropping. Um, I'm just curious, um, I'm just curious whether, what other, what other things are you guys experiencing that you think is related to hormones? Because um, I want to talk a little bit about symptoms that are not related to hormones and then today's topic that i've chosen is how to use food to rebalance your hormones um, but i want to talk a little bit about symptoms so that you will see that a lot of the symptoms are connected to hormones and there is actually just three body systems you need to take care of to address your hormonal balance um, so karen has got thyroid issues early menopause and fibroids okay fibroids is thank you for sharing so it is interesting karen knows the fibroids are related to estrogen dominance so let's talk a little bit about that um charlotte is also say, charlotte is saying unwanted facial hair okay yeah so that will be um uh, that will be oftentimes due to um high testosterone levels in women we start losing hair here and has start having hair on our facial hair and hair on our nipples um, and uh, chin and um, belly sometimes as well. So all these unwanted places, right? 
So did you guys know that a lot of other symptoms which are seemingly unrelated to hormonal imbalance are actually caused by hormones? So I'll just start off with, let's just start off from maybe top of the body, and that is your mental health. So things like, for example, depression, anxiety, just feeling blah, feeling I'm very unmotivated can be due to hormonal imbalances. And that's a lot of things can play into this. So, um, you know, whether it's high or low cortisol levels, whether it's estrogen dominance, thyroid is a huge cause for depression, right? Um, insomnia, somebody saying, Jennifer is saying insomnia. Um, so I, I will put that also in that part of the head, insomnia as in sleep. Yeah, because, uh, so insomnia can also be correlated with hormonal imbalance, especially when it comes to um, adrenal fatigue stage two, when you've got high estrogen uh, um, cortisol levels at night, or when you get a hike, uh, a spike in cortisol levels in the middle of the night, that's what can wake you up as well. Uh, Ed is saying I have Hashimoto's and TPO is 600, okay? Yeah, so we'll talk about that in a second, um, Edith. Um, other things, you know, that are kind of interesting is, I, and I'm particularly, for some reason, I have a, a super big interest in estrogen dominance, which is a, a highly um, misunderstood condition. And you think that, well, if I'm in menopause, I don't have estrogen dominance. Actually, that is not right. Um, you can have estrogen dominance even when you have low estrogen levels, believe it or not. And it gets a little bit complicated, but I'll, I will, and there's various reasons why that can happen. I'll just give you one, one of the main reasons. Um, and that is, you know, first of all, there are three different types of estrogens, right? And the, the second estrogen, E2, also known as estradiol, is the aggressive estrogen. That's the estrogen that causes um, a lot of symptoms. So let's talk about symptoms in a second for estrogen dominance so you can connect with what I'm saying. Um, who here has got issues that you know that you have estrogen dominance? And the symptoms would be that you have terrible PMSs, if you're menstruating, right? You have terrible PMSs or you don't have your period, you don't get your period, um, or you get, um, you get, you know, like when I talk about PMS, it's like the terrible moods, the pain, but also swelling, water retention, right, in the hands, um, headaches, but also other things like lumps on our breasts. Uh, are uh, predominantly estrogen due to estrogen dominance. Fibroids, somebody mentioned fibroids earlier, that can also be due to estrogen dominance, right? Um, believe it or not, for those of you who have ever experienced thyroid nodules, that can also be due to estrogen dominance, right? So who here is, um, who here is experiencing any of those things I'm talking about? Okay, Mahmouda says she's got it, Edith has, has got it. Um, and, um, Let's see, can't lose weight. Um, yeah, that could also be due to estrogen dominance, um, but also a lot of other hormonal imbalances. Um, so, you know, so, and, and then the, 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 the one that is really, really has a lot of my interest in, every year in October, um, when there is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I always do a special on that because majority of breast cancers are actually estrogenic cancer, something that we don't talk about. It's, you know, Angelina Jolie gets a lot of press, but hers is a genetic one, which is a very rare form of uh, a predisposition towards the cancer. Everyone else, actually, most other people, like you're talking about 90% of cases of estrogen dominance, or sorry, breast cancers are due to estrogen dominance. The interesting thing that the way it happens is Allison is saying she's got thyroid nodules, um, Karen is saying fibroids and thyroid nodules. So Karen, estrogen dominance, screaming symptom of, of that, right, is estrogen dominance. And, and I have to tell you, estrogen dominance is one of the easiest um, hormonal imbalance to actually take care of, to be honest, um, compared to like when you've got Hashimoto's, for example, there's a lot of digestive issues that you need to take care of. There's, there could be infections that are triggering the autoimmune response, right? Um, but estrogen dominance is pretty straightforward, and I'll talk about this in a second. Um, so let's see, what else? Um, estrogen dominance, you also have things like infertility issues, miscarriages oftentimes happen due to too much of estrogen as compared to progesterone. And um, progesterone, as you know, is the hormone, as the word, as the name implies, progesterone, progestation, right? So um, for reproduction, right? And for growth of the baby. And uh, when it's, when it's, Either the progesterone is low or the estrogen is too high and it's suppressing the progesterone. That's when we have estrogen dominance that can be causing infertility or miscarriages. Um, yeah, so those are some of the, you know, um, and other little symptoms that you can see is that when you put on weight around your hips, did you guys know that? When you put your weight around your hips, that's oftentimes due to estrogen dominance. 
Um, and uh, and so women who put on who are like so th those are the pairs women who are pairs tend to be estrogen dominant where women who are the apples the proverbial apples so most of the weight is around be the belly area it tends to be more due to um, you know things like uh, a metabolic disorder so in hormonal terms it will be things like insulin resistance high testosterone levels um, where sugar is predominantly the issue right so Ursula is saying she's got mood swings, anxiety, and menopause. Yeah. Um, is maca good for perimenopause? Erica is asking. Um, Angela, would you mind posting our article on maca? It's uh, maca is an interesting one. It's a it's a it can be a hit and miss um, food for some people, and the quality and the type of maca you're using is really important. So I want to talk about other things today. So um, I will get um, let's let's get Angela to post the link and pin it to the top about maca. We've researched this a lot, and the answer is sometimes some women just swear by it, and others get worse, and others just don't get any results whatsoever. So a lot of you have here have mentioned so many different symptoms, right? And many of them are hormonally related. Let me just mention one more, which is super common. Adrenal fatigue, right? So many of you have mentioned here like insomnia, having high cortisol at night. Adrenal fatigue can be stage two or stage three. Stage two is when you start having it. So your, your hormones are up on some days and low on, on others. That's just stress response hormone. How this can manifest in terms of symptoms could be anything from you know, getting up from a sofa and getting lightheaded, really bad moods, um, you tend to be, be much more prone to crying for no reason, having sleeping problems, especially at night or in the middle of the night waking. Uh, you can't get up in the morning, uh, you know, at all from the bed unless you have like two cups of coffee to get you going, right? And so, so those are some of the symptoms. And, you know, horrendous fatigue is another one, adrenal fatigue, um, right? So, you know, it's kind of interesting, right? Like how oftentimes we do not really correlate those symptoms. Like doctors saying, well, you, we see a doctor and go, I've got, I can't sleep, right? Somebody mentioned here, well, you got sleep apnea, right? Take a sleeping pill. Rather than me you know, obviously going under the root cause, going for the root cause of what is causing it, which I know most of you are here because you, you want to find out about how to fix it in ways other than pills. So, um, and by the way, there is, um, if you're not sure what hormonal imbalance you have, go to hormonesbalance.com, my website, slash quiz, right? And, uh, and there are seven different hormonal imbalances. You can find out which one is it that you're struggling with. So what I want to talk about today is, it, it's kind of interesting, you know, a lot of times um, we get, the, I get this question, my team gets this question, where people say, what well, you guys post, like, is maca good for me, right? Is, uh, what, what are the, what's the one food that I can do to reverse hot flashes? Um, you know, should I take black hahash, right? What, what, what food should I eat for thyroid, right? And so, you know, and those are all good questions, and I'm so happy you're here because it just shows that you really believe that nutrition and food and your lifestyle choices, how you sleep and how you perceive stress and how you take care of yourself, how much you love yourself can have a profound impact how your hormones manifest. Having said that, I want to just offer you a little bit of a reframe today because a lot of times it's not just about the one food that you need to add on. It's not about the three foods that you need to add on. It's about um, Mary Tyler saying, I love the breakfast you make at Thyroid Secret. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to talk about breakfast in just a second. So, you know, um, the... The way I approach hormonal health is based on a three-legged stool analogy. So imagine, I've got these long sleeves today here, they kind of get in the way. So imagine a three-legged stool, right? It's got three legs. Now, in order to sit comfortably on this stool, imagine, right? You've got to have all the three legs in place. If one of the legs is short, you start wobbling. That's very uncomfortable. If one of the legs is missing, you're just definitely going to collapse, right? And so the same thing is with hormonal balance is that there are three bodily systems that you want to take care of really well. And when you do, a lot of the symptoms that you guys had mentioned here that you've been struggling with will go away. So do you guys want to take a guess for those of you who haven't been following me for that long or you haven't done my programs in the past because then you know what they are. But if, you, if, you just, if you're just joining, I'm curious to know Take a guess, what are those three bodily systems that I'm talking about that govern really good hormonal balance? And I'm just going to look at some of the other comments that you guys have made. Um, 
depression, Sally is saying, yeah, depression can be related to hormones as well. Um, Leanne Hope is saying uh, gut health. Absolutely. Yes, that's the first one. Thank you. Yay. Um, absolutely. That's the first one. So let me talk about gut health first. Well, lymphatic system. That's a, that's a nice, um, that's a nice attempt. You know, um, I would say that has a lot to do with the immune system, which is, um, Rebecca. And, uh, I don't really see much that we can do nutritionally for the lymphatic system per se that helps with rounds of hormones. I would say, no, not that one. Clara Fah says endocrine gut. Yeah. So we've, so we've got gut coming in. There's two more. So think about it. So let's talk about, let me talk about gut and the qual and, and Judy saying quality of sleep. Absolutely. But it's not one of the legs because I'm talking about nutritionally. So you're right. that on top of that, you know, good sleep, managing stress, um, living in a clean place, uh, definitely uh, would help uh, the hormonal rebalance. So let's talk about the first one, which is the gut health. Thank you for mentioning that. And the reason why the gut health is so important when it comes to hormonal uh, rebalancing is for many, many reasons, but I'm just going to cover two today. Did you guys know that today the microbiome, which is the set of bacteria that lives in our intestines, the small and large intestine, is as big as the weight of the brain? We never really knew this before, right? Like we've been so afraid of bacteria in the past. So imagine like, I don't know, most of us have never held the brain of, a, of, of, of an animal or human, but I'm sure you can imagine that. And that weight, that's exactly the weight that you're carrying. It's about three pounds of bacteria that you're having in your gut. Now they have a job to do. And we are now discovering what it is that the microbiome is doing. And one of the fascinating things, at least for us here, I think, because we're all about hormones, is that there are specific subset of bacteria that regulate how the hormones are created and excreted. And one of the things that I started talking about was estrogen dominance. So guess what? There is a subset of bacteria called the estrobolum. And the estrobolum helps to break down the estrogenic, the, 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 those parts of estrogen or the estrogen metabolites that are very harmful. Those are the very metabolites that quickly help proliferate the cancer cells in our breasts. And those are the very estrogenic metabolites that are responsible for breast cancers, for breast lumps, for fibroids, for uh, thyroid nodules. Thyroid cancers are actually estrogenic cancers as well. Did you guys know, I don't work with men, but like for those of you who have partners, um, is that estrogen, uh, sorry, estrogen is also, um, uh, uh, prostate cancer is also an estrogenic cancer in man. And so the estro going back to the microbiome, the estrobolum breaks down those estrogens and helps to metabolize and excrete the harmful estrogens that are causing all that havoc in our body. So who would have thought that having a healthy gut could actually prevent you from developing breast cancers, breast lumps, and having all these things that I talked about, right? Thyroid nodules, fibroids. Nobody ever talks about that, right? And that, is, that can be so huge. And so how do you restore the estrobolum since it's part of the gut? Well, I think it's a, to, in my world, it's like a push and pull strategy. On one hand, you wanna push in really good food in there, things like fermented foods, not kombucha though. I'm not a fan of kombucha at all. It's very yeasty. A lot of women have candida and actually makes things worse. But I'm talking about things like sauerkraut and kimchi and dill pickles and miso if you can tolerate soy, right? G really great fermented foods coupled with good probiotics. Good, you know, one of the one of the very few supplements that I I ever associate myself with is because they made such a profound difference in my life. Uh, the spore-based probiotics from Megas Probiotics and the spores are like the cops and they help regulate to get the good bacteria to surface to the ground and, and revive themselves and then suppress the pathogenic bacteria. And I have seen a lot of women having really good results with the spore, bi the spore biotics. Um, Angela, would you mind posting the link to the spore biotics, the uh, hormonesbalance.com slash spore biotic, I think is the link. Um, so, so the ladies can watch the video about it. I think it's a fascinating, we did a video about how the gut is so related to, connected to the bacteria in the gut are so related to hormones if you want to know more. So that's one thing. The other thing about the gut, right, is that when you're having constant digestive issues going on, like constipation, gas, pain in the gut, right, um, you know, you have, you're burping all the time, you have acid reflux, right, 
you know, you might not perceive this as stress because to us, stress most of the time is like, oh, you know, I'm not stressed about my job. I'm not stressed about my relationship, so I'm fine, right? But stress can also be, be physical. Like somebody who is a marathon runner can create stress in the body, uh, especially in women. And, um, and then you have a lot of digestive stress. If you have infections going on like HPV, like EBV, you know, these infections can also be causing stress in the body. And guess what? When there is that, when is that, when that stress is going on, right? When you're constantly bloated, you're constantly um, having digestive pain, foot sits there and it's just not moving, your digestion is struggling. And that form of stress calls for cortisol release. And when cortisol gets released, uh, that's when it, it leads to adrenal fatigue. And cortisol really is the king of all hormones because it can really, it can bring down a lot of other hormones. It can, for example, it can slow down the conversion between T4 to T3 hormone for those of you who are on thyroid medication or who have thyroid issues. It can, it can um, you know, desensitize the cells, progesterone cells, the receptors from coming through. And so you might be having sufficient progesterone levels, but then when you are having high cortisol levels, that progesterone is not getting through to the receptor. That's why women who are constantly stressed out can get pregnant, even though they have progesterone, um, sufficient progesterone, or they are supplementing with progesterone and taking drugs or whatever. But when they are constantly stressed out, that's a lot of times what's stopping them from getting pregnant. So, and there is there is a few other reasons in, in but, that really take care of your gut is the biggest thing. And how do you do that? You know, one thing is, um, I, I feel like a lot of times we talk about specific things like, is coffee good for me? Is bread, you know, is, what about gluten? Should I drop, uh, should I be incorporating maca? Should I be doing supplements or not? Which supplements should I be doing, right? And the, the, the interesting thing about all of this is that Angela, um, Sorry, just not the one that says before you, before you purchase because we that's the video for people who actually want to buy. I want to have the educational video um, that says hormonesbalance.com slash sporebiotic, the educational video that I did with, with Kieran, who is a microbiologist, um, which is, who is brilliant. So what is... Um, what I want to tell you about is that, you know, there is, um, there is a free education. I don't know how many, how many of you here have done the cooking for balance program with me? Um, the, the full program or who here has watched the free workshop. So if you go to cookingforbalance.com, um, and Angela is going to post the link, uh, is the free workshop that where I teach, how do you use food to rebalance your hormones? Talking about the three body systems and it's an hour and a half. It's a pretty long workshop. There is a replay, so you can always play it back when you, if you don't have the full time to see it. Um, but um, you know, one of the one of the things that, that that's cool about it is that I talk about the digestive health and how do you fix it then. And the, doing the elimination diet is really the easiest thing to do um, to address that, and so to remove those inflammatory foods and then adding foods that are super healing, right? Um, and is saying me, um, yeah, and then so a number of you have done the workshop. That's awesome. So the workshop is totally free, and um, and it's um, it's you know, and so from there there is an opportunity for continuation if you wanna if you wanna dive deeper, and if you don't, you're gonna learn a ton from that workshop that you can start implementing tomorrow already. Um, let's see what else do we have in terms of comments? Yeah, so somebody got it right. I saw that earlier. Let's see who was that. Um, somebody said liver and sugar levels, Deborah. So way, way to go, Deborah. Um, yeah, so the liver, guess what? The liver is, just in case you don't know, it's on the, let me just get up here a little bit. So it's on the right side here, just under your, your boobie and right under your rib cage. That's your liver. So if you put a right hand over your liver, take a deep breath in, that's your liver. And, um, you know, in Chinese medicine, it's actually considered a, um, a, um, uh, a, an organ of anger and emotion, especially anger. And so, you know, a lot of times when people start cleansing their liver, especially really quickly and aggressively through like uh, detoxes and stuff like that, right? A lot of anger starts coming up. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. But on top of that, the liver is also responsible for conversion of um, and a number, so number of hormones. So for example, the T4 hormone 
is in thyroid gets converted to the T3 hormone. Why is that important? Is because T4, which you take typically, like if you take instant uh, it, it's a synthetic version of T4 hormone that your hormone that your thyroid should be producing but is not producing. And then the liver takes over to convert it, and the gut actually the two convert that to T3. And T3 is really what gives you beautiful hair, what gives you beautiful skin, gives you energy, clarity of mind, ability to get pregnant, and all that good stuff, right? With with the thyroid. So, and then for estrogen, right? Um, so since we talked about estrogen dominance earlier, the liver is also responsible for detoxifying off of a lot of the estrogen, especially the the really bad ones, right? And so the the you know the catabolic the anabolic, sorry, the catabolic uh, estrogens and the estradiol, and specifically they are metabolites of the first estrogen. I don't want to be going too geeky here on this call, but, you know, estrogens are not just estrogens. There are, like I said, three types. And then, like, for example, the E1 estrogen gets broken down to two different types of, three actually different types of estrogens, metabolites. And there's one particularly that is super, super dangerous. So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you can really help yourself a lot by doing. And the elimination diet is great because it removes a lot of the inflammatory foods to help your liver really move and, and recover. There's a lot of other things that you can do, like cruciferous vegetables and anything that's bitter and tinctures, make it of dandelion. I teach all of that in the Cooking for Balance workshop. So make sure you sign up for it this weekend and watch it because there's a lot of things you can pick up, what you can do to help yourself. And you don't have to go through aggressive detoxes and spend a lot of money on unnecessary supplements. There are things you can do through juicing, through just elimination of certain foods, uh, coffee and alcohol, a lot of fatty foods during that time, and adding um, those bitter foods, cruciferous vegetables, a really wonderful way of supporting your liver that way. Um, another thing, you know, it kind of goes back to earlier what we talked about the gut is that when you're constipated, right, all the hormones that you are producing um, did you guys know that when you produce the hormones, they get utilized by the body, right? And then when they are, have done their job, they get back into the bloodstream. The liver sieves is the sieve that separates the, you know, the metabolized estrogens or metabolized hormones in general. And then guess what? We poop them out. And we poop them out with the help of the bile. So the gallbladder is really important in the whole function of that. But also having a good bowel, daily bowel movement is so important. So that, go, again, goes back to the health of the gut. If you're constantly constipated, guess what? The, the toxins re-enter the body. And the body struggles to create always a, some form of uh, you know, a, a, a symbiosis and, um, and balance in the body, right? And so in order to create the best balance that it can, it tries really hard not to allow things like heavy metals and the, the more harmful things to re-enter the body so it releases things like the hormones because they are they will do less damage to us than for example heavy metals would right so again having having a good daily bowel movement really really important for your hormonal health as well so i talked about the liver um let's see what are the milk thistle somebody's asking barb yes milk, milk thistle is great barb and here's the thing i just want to um do you recommend phytoestrogenic supplements? So to all of you asking like those very specific questions about this supplement, that supplement, what about maca, what about this? Here is my here is my take on it, and I hope you can appreciate it and understand it because I know you, all of you here on this call are really smart. Otherwise, you won't be here. Um, is that you know if you're popping a supplement, let's say if you're taking milk milk thistle, Barb, while you're still eating gluten, while you're drinking coffee five times a day, while you're not sleeping, right? While you're constipated, um, you don't have a good bowel movement because of whatever reasons, right? Um, would milk thistle itself help the liver? The answer is no. It will help it some. But I've always found that herbs and supplements are hugely beneficial when we clean up our diet. And so doing it is in a conjunction, doing it as a protocol, doing it as a, you know, in a cohesive approach rather than just be be picking one food at a time going oh you know like my hair is falling i'm just gonna do vitamin i'm just gonna load up on biotin that should help me well it might but for a lot of people it doesn't help because there's a lot of other things going on so i really want to i want to pull you away from that what's the one food and what's the one supplement mentality and look at the health of your liver the health of your uh, your um, your gut 
and we're going to talk about sugar levels in a second. And 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 assess those because one thing I want to tell you is that when you when you take care of these three bodily systems, there is so much of improvement that happens that a lot of the time you don't even need to look into any anything else because a lot of the symptoms will just start vanishing. Let me talk about the third body system and that's sugar levels. And many of you have asked here about hot flashes and I know it's a common problem in uh, the followers of Hormones Balance. And I actually did a whole call on hot flashes. So if you go to hormonesbalance.com slash, actually, I don't know what's the slash. Go to my website, hormonesbalance.com. There's live Q and A's with Magdalena on the tab on top. Click on that. Look, hot, look for hot flashes. I did a whole long call on that. And guess what? One of the things about hot flashes is that they come upon us when our sugar levels drop. And this is when you typically get a lot of hot flashes. So if you manage to maintain your sugar levels in a really nice, um, healthy levels throughout the day and until late at night, right, then you will experience far less hot flashes. I've seen a lot of women having also a lot of experience, a lot of relief when they give up coffee, sugar, um, caffeine, so coffee, or any form of caffeine, in fact, um, gluten, dairy, those are some of the four foods to, to give up, stabilize your sugar levels, and you should be good. So can you see, like, it keeps, everything kind of keeps going back to that three-legged stool analogy, right? Fix those three legs, and you will sit so comfortably on that stool, you would not even need all these cushions. I call those supplements and all these additional add-ons as cushions. Um, so... Let's see, what else do we have coming in? I'm just gonna look at your questions. Um, what about increasing fats like in keto? Yeah, uh, 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 Jam Alba, uh, am I pronouncing the name right? It's a great question. So Jam, you know, I will be honest with you, I am not an expert in, in keto. I've tried it on myself for three days and I had the worst three days of my life. <laughs> I really did. I felt awful, but you know what? It, it made me realize one thing <clears throat> that Actually, I wasn't produ producing sufficient amount of gold uh, bile. And so for anybody here who is, in, who is eating fats and you are feeling or eating meat and then you feel like that thing it sits in your stomach forever and you're making you feeling nauseous and you're feeling brain dead and you're so, ener you know, not energized to do anything and you're very apathetic towards everything and everybody, right? That's when it's a sign that you are not digesting those fats and proteins very well. And you can play around and see whether it's the fats or the protein that you're doing, but increasing your gold uh, bladder function or bile, you can add on certain things like bowel um, acids, ox bile acids, or just clean up your diet, like what I was talking about, especially for the liver protocol. Um, but also then um what was the other thing i was gonna say was about um yeah stomach acid like if you have insufficient stomach acid and i did stomach acid two weeks ago i talked about the importance of stomach acid um when you're not breaking things down that is a great sign so i'm sorry to answer to take a long time to answer your question but i don't really know enough about keto i know some people have incredible results with it um and i think it's a great thing to try to get educated uh on anybody's journey um you know, I am, I'm personally more interested in, in working with more sustainable ways of eating because if you're eating keto, you're toast if you go out with friends, right? And Or if you're having social life or if you're traveling, then it's just not something you can do outside of your home, at least from my experience. So uh, let's see, what else do we have in terms of questions coming in? Uh, Claire is asking, when do some people wake up in the early hours uh, unable to get back to sleep? Is it adrenals or blood sugar? Great question, Claire. It can be both. And so uh, one of the reasons why we want to rebalance blood sugar levels is because every time you have a sugar high, so that, like if you, for example, if you're eating cereals for breakfast, right, uh, you didn't eat, you're eating a bagel for breakfast or you're eating, you know, even having a smoothie for breakfast, right? With a banana and mango and beets and oranges and whatever else, or juice, juices are the worst first thing in the morning. Um, you're giving yourself a sugar spike, but guess what? Once the sugar goes up, it will come down, it will come down crashing, right? So somebody has mentioned here that she really likes my breakfast that I was creating. Um, I was I was showing, I think that was probably in the thyroid secret video that I, Isabella and I did the segment. What was cool about it is that um, the you know a really sustain sustained a large breakfast like i call it a pff breakfast protein fat and fiber kind of breakfast 
and log into the Cooking for Balance workshop, then you'll see the recipe. I've, I've given away like three recipes there during the call. You can watch it. Um, it really will sustain your blood sugar levels. And when you do that, then you also experience you sleep better. One of my favorite sayings that somebody, um, you know, put, posted on, on our, like a close community, right, of people who've done my programs. She said, in order to change my nights, I had to change my mornings. It's beautifully said, right? Um, so what she's saying is that she had to change her breakfast in order to enjoy better quality sleep. And that is so true for, for many of us. You know, and I have to tell you, this is something that even functional medicine doctors not always know about. And I want to give you uh, an example. I was listening to a podcast of somebody who is teaching at one of the functional medicine schools and very knowledgeable. She teaches about hormones, right? And she was sharing a story about how she noticed that 11 o'clock every morning she has this sugar drop, right? Oh, sorry, she gets hot flashes. And so she says, you know, I realized, I've, I've realized that myself that I, um, my sugar levels are dropping at 11. So instead of allowing that to happen, she said I would have like a, a handful of nuts at 1030 to give, you know, to give the body sufficient amount of protein and to stabilize my sugar levels. I don't go into the crash, right? And I thought to myself, I mean, that's a good solution. But then the question is, what do you eat for breakfast to have these kind of hot, these kind of sugar drops in the first place? Because I can tell you, when you eat a PFF breakfast, you are not going to have 11 o'clock crashes at all. And it's so much easier for your digestion. It's so much easier for your sugar levels. You don't going to struggle. You're going to have so much more energy throughout the day. You're going to find yourself not needing coffee. Um, and so just amazing benefits really are. Um, do you guys want to know what I had for breakfast today? Let me just... Um, Le Leanne Hope is saying, what if I don't have a gallbladder? Yeah, so if you don't, and Le the, uh, uh, Leanna is, I, I would suggest to do um, ox bile salts that you can add on. And they are wonderful in helping you, um, what you're not producing, and it's going to help you with your hormones a lot. I see a lot of women who have their gallbladders removed. And in this country, I think there's like a 250,000 operations every year. Very, very quickly, doctors are like, has to go. And the fact is that, you know, a lot of, a lot of these women can be, a lot of these um, gallbladders can be saved. It's just, you know, Western medicine just doesn't operate that way. Um, so, yeah, so I see a lot of women developing hormonal problems um, after that and after removal of the gallbladder, like within three to six months. And, you know, for most of us, we don't connect the dots because the doctors don't tell us. And they're going to say, it's actually like you don't need a gallbladder to function. You don't, but what quantity of life is that, right? Um, Charlotte is saying she's tried gallbladder uh, ox bile and it made me sick, very upset tummy. Okay, cool. So one thing you can do is it depends on the quality you're taking and the amount. So one thing you guys can try is there is a really cool supplement that um, I use a lot. It's combined also with herbs. And um, it is from Designs for Health. You can get it on Amazon, Designs for Health, and it's called LV-BG. Is that a BG or GB? I always get confused, but one of those, okay? So Designs for Health, um, and it's LV-BG is the name of the supplement. A uh, really great one. What is PFF breakfast, Karen is asking? PFF stands for protein, fat, and fiber. So do you guys want to know what I had for breakfast today? You want me to tell you? Otherwise, there's a lot of recipes. Um, High TP so Ed is talking about high TPOs for B12 levels, um, and uh, and my B12 levels are high at 8:46. So, yeah. So Ed, the first thing is when you have high TPOs, and I think you mentioned earlier there was like at 600, right? Is that you? One of the things that you want to look at is the health of your gut. So the immune system starts in the gut, and taking care of your digestive system is the first thing that you can do to rebalance your hormones. Um, 